So the mitochondria, as we mentioned, has an important role in production of energy in both humans, animals, and plant cells. It essentially breaks down nutrients such as carbohydrates or fatty acids. It oxidizes them throughout this long process that eventually creates energy molecules that we refer to as ATPs. Our cells and organs use these ATP molecules as an energy for function. For example, when I'm contracting the muscles or the heart is pumping or the brain is, is functioning 24 seven, all of those organs require energy that is, is basically produced from the mitochondria. And mitochondria, very interestingly, contains their own genetic material. It has its own DNA, which resembles a bacterium Rickettsia uh, prosecchi. Now, some scientists believe that this symbiotic relationship between humans and bacteria was created as the human body evolved. Here, we're going to take a look at an overview of the process as a reminder. And we can see here the cellular respiration, which is the process that takes place in the cells to convert chemical energy from oxygen molecules and nutrients, such as glucose, into adenosine triphosphate, which is ATP, and then it releases waste product. During glycolysis, different enzymes split the molecule of glucose into two mole molecules of pyruvate, also known as pyruvic acid. Pyruvate is then turned into acetyl coenzyme A, and in the Krebs cycle, the main source of energy for cells the available chemical energy of acetyl coenzyme A is then modified into the reducing power of nicotinamide adenine denucleotide, which is NADH. Then we proceed into the electron transfer chain, which creates an electrochemical gradient that leads to the creation of ATP. Now, this is a part of the oxidative phosphorylation process that creates ATP. Two of the metabolites that are left are water and CO2. Now essentially, we're taking nutrients and forming energy to, for the cell to, to function. So here's a list of some, a few of the common conditions associated with mitochondrial dysfunction. You can see here chronic fatigue, muscle weakness, loss of muscle coordination, learning disabilities or spectrum disorders, neuropathy or autonomic nervous system dysfunction, we got organ failures that are associated with mitochondrial dysfunction, such as heart, kidney. You got neurodegenerative conditions, such as Parkinson or Alzheimer's disease. You got migraines, visual or hearing problems. Again, nerve-related issues, uh, damage to the nerve, dysfunctional nerve uh, can be associated, might be associated with mitochondrial dysfunction, fibromyalgia, schizophrenia and bipolar disorders, and it could be pretty much almost any chronic or inflammatory autoimmune condition. So when we look at secondary mitochondrial dysfunction, there are typically two issues, if we're really oversimplifying this whole major topic, that could interfere or lead to mitochondrial dysfunction. The first one is the lack of specific nutrients that the mitochondrials require in order to properly function. The second one are factors that inhibit or disrupt mitochondrial function. Let's talk about those factors. So we mentioned that when we review the mitochondrial function, this is the process in which the nutrients, the oxygens are coming in, right? And this is the entire process here that we're seeing this in the middle in which these nutrients are oxidized into molecules of energy. So we want to ask ourselves, what are the two major aspects? And the first one, of course, is lack of absorption of certain nutrients that, could, that are required to the mitochondria. So we're not just talking about glucose. We're not just talking about eating enough protein or fats, right? We're talking about nutrients that are specific to the mitochondrial function. And we're going to mention a few of them. And that could be due to lack of absorption, that could be the bioavailability, that could be changing in the patient's gut. And then on the other hand, there are specific factors that could directly interfere with this energy production process. And so I'll give you a few examples. There are several pharmaceutical drugs, for example, for, uh, such as antibiotics, 
uh, that were found to decrease mitochondrial membrane potential, downregulate the electronic uh, transfer chain function and protein synthesis. You also have the, the antidepressant SSRIs uh, that were reported to reduce mitochondrial biogenesis, decrease respiratory activity, uh, cholesterol medication. Some statins might lead to mitochondrial damage with disruption of the mitochondrial respiratory chain and decreased production of ATP and, and could lead to increase of reactive oxygen species as well as calcium leakage. And then you have some chemotherapy agents which increases oxidative stress and mitochondrial damage. Some environmental factors uh, are heavy metals, uh, pesticides and solvents, pellets and plasticizers, uh, those are used to make plastic more flexible and durable and, and sometimes to dissolve other materials. They're, they're used all around us in fast food, high fat dairy products, uh, fatty meats, uh, cooking oil, lubricating oil, and personal care products, even topically, not just oral consumption. It's also topically through soaps, shampoos, and hairsprays. Exposure through air, water, food, and occasional infants, for example, breast milk, a mother's breast milk were, was found to contain over 20 different environmental chemicals in one, one study that was published. And children, if they put toys in their mouth, they're also going to be exposed to that. And then infections, for example, pathogens can impact the mitochondrial function and can also play a role in the intracellular survival and response against infection. There was one report that uh, stated that H. pylori, for example, is very common, um, um, especially with older population, um, actively induces disruption of the mitochondrial that leads to cell death. These are just a few examples. Again, this is a, there's a very comprehensive training that we have on the mechanism and clinical application and exactly what to do with each one of those um, when, and, and how would the labs look like. And then mitochondrial function unfortunately reduces with age. So we know that it's not just our metabolism and it's not just our hormones that are changing as we age. It's also the mitochondria. Now, of course, there are specific strategies to mitigate that as much as possible. Uh, we have a whole training just on cellular aging the pathways and different nutritional lifestyle and herbal strategies from evidence-based that could be useful for patients. And when we look at some of those labs, uh, there are specific symptoms that can help us identify secondary mitochondrial dysfunction with patients. And there are specific lab tests that can help us to determine what's not prop working properly. And you can see this is an example uh, of a lab that basically you can see the different, uh, we're going to zoom into it, but you can see the different aspects of how fat, carbohydrates, and proteins are being metabolized into acetyl-CoA uh, and then into the citric acid, the Krebs cycle, and into energy uh, uh, molecules of energy. So here, for example, this is, this is where we're zooming into the Krebs cycle and the electronic electron tra transport chain. And you can see here how uh, there are different there are different nutrients here. So for example, you can see here there's mercury, arsenic, antimony that were found in this specific patient's report to be interfering with the conversion of citric acid to cis-aconitic acid. And that's, we have specific strategies on how to properly support healthy detoxification and binding of those heavy metals to eliminate them from the body. But again, knowledge is power because when you have all this data in front of you, you can be very specific with your treatment strategies. You can also see different nutrients here. Uh, you can also see, for example, different cofactors like, such as iron, glutathione. You also have the CoQ10, which is really important. Uh, you can see, for example, those help in, within the Krebs cycle in different processes. And those are really important because if the patient does not, again, does not consume sufficient amount of those nutrients, or they're not absorbing sufficient amount of nutrients, or they have a problem with their gut or metabolism, then what will happen is they might not have sufficient amount of those nutrients to properly process, properly 
function properly operate the, the Krebs cycle or other parts of the, of the energy production cycle and they might not produce a, a energy molecules uh, very well. Another example is CoQ10. The production of CoQ10 is blocked by or inhibited by some statin medication and CoQ10 is really important in the, uh, the electron transfer chain uh, to transfer uh, electrons into complex number three and so that's another very very important nutrient and with patients that are taking statins uh, sometimes they have lower amounts of CoQ10 because of that side effect of medication and this is where it's really helpful to understand those pathways and mechanisms and then also understand the drug induced nutrient depletion so when you prescribe to a patient a certain drug you also understand what would be how would that impact their mitochondrial function right that will be important for brain function down the road that will be also important for uh, cardiovascular uh, the heart function and cardiovascular function so that's all these connections are really important for us providers to know these are additional markers of course this this particular lab testing uh, is referred to as the organic acid there are a few different types of mitochondrial labs uh, each present information in a slightly different way um, and some present different information than other other labs but here you can see additional markers that these labs some of those labs provide uh, the ones that we recommend the two specific labs that we recommend uh, such as the organic acid test will are very beneficial to also uh, indicate if there's a yeast or dysbiosis in the gut there's uh, environmental factors methylation issues and one of the mistakes that we often see providers are making is they're very interesting in the functional medicine labs and so they rush to learn those labs and or they read about it or they watch uh, a few lectures on it but they they're lacking a deeper understanding of the mechanisms as a provider you really want to make sure that you have a deep understanding of these mechanisms and the labs and the different markers um, as well as the treatment strategies so if you are interested in learning about the root cause of chronic conditions gaining new skills and offering comprehensive care then i invite you to check out our advanced and clinical functional medicine program. We focus on the clinical application. The program is comprehensive, self-based, and completely online, which means that you can study from anywhere and you can study at your own pace around your schedule. This program also includes advanced modules such as treating, geriatric, autoimmune, women's health, men's health, autoimmune condition, chronic pain, genomics, as well as functional pediatrics. So it's very, very comprehensive in terms of all the classes that are offered in functional, nutritional, and herbal medicine. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to us. You can schedule a short call with our admission advisor and ask questions about the program, get some additional information, connect with us. And so I really appreciate you watching this growing your skills and offering comprehensive care to your patients. I wish you the best of health and I will see you in the next class.